Hello and welcome back to coverage of the World Magic Cup. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. I'm with Simon Gertzen. It's our pleasure to bring you coverage of the quarterfinals. We're in the third of four. This is Japan versus France. We're going to kick things off on our far table there. Ken Yukihiro representing Japan and he's running Celestia Agro. He's playing against Jean-Emmanuel Dupra on Golgari Midrange. Now, Golgari Midrange is a pretty known quantity here at the World Magic Cup. All the teams in our top eight have one copy of that, of their three unified standard decks. But on the other side of the table, Celestia Agro is not something we see very often here. Exactly. This is the shell that we know from Celestia tokens with uh, Emara and Venerator Loxodon. You want those Conclave Tribunals. History of Benalia, of course, one of the best cards in the whole deck. However, um, Yoko Hero decided not to play March of the Multitudes and Sephiroth Migration. Instead, there are main deck uh, Nullhide Feroxes, Thorn Lieutenants, Ajani's Adversary of Tyrants. It's a really interesting build. Okay, more compact build, although I will note here that uh, Yuki Hero not playing that third land on his turn. And meanwhile, Jean Emmanuel Dupra. Kind of doing the curve out thing here. Now, it wasn't perfect, right? Uh, often you'll see the Wild Growth Walker followed up by a Jade Light Ranger. And this was kind of the mini version of that. The Merfolk Branch Walker was the follow up to the Walker. But still, all of a sudden, he's got the board fairly stabilized here. Absolutely. Wild Growth Walker is the key card against the aggressive decks. And we might see it get. Kiss uh, it goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. Conclave Tribunal to take care of that Walker before it gets out of hand. But the cool part about this play, of course, is Amara Soldi Accord able to still generate some board advantage even while casting that removal spell. Yeah. And including Flower Flourish in your deck is almost free. We saw it did cost a mana here, but it did also uh, get Yoko Hero to the third land so that uh, the history of Benelias can come, can come down. Yeah, there's a fourth land off the top of the library as well, Temple Garden for Yuki Hero. So things cruising along nicely for him. And here we go, History of Benalia. This is the card that he wanted to play last turn, but he'll have to settle for it now. But it looks pretty good here, only facing down a Merfolk Branch Walker. You've got to figure to process something to do here, right? Uh, removal he's, spell? He's something? kind of signaling uh, uh, Brass's Contempt because he wanted to potentially stop Yoko Hero with oh the God. History this, of Benelia. This isn't a Loxodon, is it? I think it is. Oh, wow, what a turn for Ken Yukihiro. Just flooding the board with not only tokens, but plus one, plus one counters for them as well. And a cast down on the Loxodon. Well, that's not even that big of a deal if you're sitting in Yukihiro's seat. This turn was still just devastating. It was, and it was uh, impossible for Depra to really do much about that because Emara is a legendary creature. So he, didn't, he decided that he didn't want to spend a cast down on a token. Right. He did find a 4-4 for it, so he's going to be happy with that. But now it's land go again for Depra. What is he working with in his hand here? Carney T, Carney T, find finality and a pair of cast downs. So we see the game plan here <laughs> for Depra. Cast finality and then start flooding the board with Carnage Tyrants. But there's one missing ingredient here, and it's a sixth land. This is what uh, Depra desperately needs to find. Does he not need to fire off a cast down on a token here just to stem the bleeding? Or can he realistically hope to just take all of this and then hope to find that untapped land for finality? Well, it looks like he says, well, I'm going to trade off because this creature's going to die anyway. If I do find that land, and I'm just going to take the rest. Yep. Probably just gambling on a on a land here. Wow, this is there is a lot on this draw step right now. An untapped land for Depra could just be the game winner, though. Interestingly, we're going to see Nullhide Ferox now from Yuki Hero, which gives him a reasonable backup plan. And that's that's actually perfect for Depra because yeah. he's he's being rewarded <laughs> for waiting. Oh, it was not a land. It was a Vraska's Contempt off the top of the library, Simon, and this could be disaster here for the Frenchman. Uh, he's taking thirteen next turn, so he's not. Ooh. Dead in the water. I, I know it's not a great spot to be in, and another Nullhead Ferox would also be problematic, but he's not he's not facing lethal yet. Okay, and he also can use this uh, this Vraska's Contempt to take care, finally, of Amara if he'd like, and that also stems the bleeding with an additional two. He's going to do that right now before she creates yet another lifelinking token. No, although the, the token wasn't all that relevant, because mm. you, your only ode to this board is to draw a land, uh, to draw a land and okay. cast finality. Okay. Um, 
Ken accidentally knocked a die off of his soldier token. Really? Thought he traded for the one with... There, there was three of them with... Ken. Oh, one of them was Amara. Okay. And there's a Johnny. Wow. You can see that Ken Yukihiro is prepared for sweepers. Uh, he has hit this board from different angles. He's had Nullhide Ferox, which doesn't die to the sweeper that he fears. And now he's got a Planeswalker that will be left over in the case that Dupra does find that untapped land. Absolutely, which he has to draw now. Yeah, must draw it right here for Johnny Mandel, Dupra, and Team France. And he missed. That should do it. And he's going to scoop him up. Two chances to find that untapped land and get himself back in the game. But the pressure from Yukihiro was not only a lot on board, it was also coming from different types of permanents, a 6-6, Planeswalker, and a bunch of little tokens. And uh, game number one going to Team Japan with Ken Yukihiro there, their captain. Ken is such an impressive player. Um, a little bit different style than, than a lot of the other Japanese players we've, we've come, to known, come to know, but uh, for me, it's really inspirational, the, the way he, he composes himself and still goes for the crazy things every once in a while. Crazy decks, crazy plays. And he succeeds with them, too. That's the thing. I, you know, there's a lot of players that will show up with some crazy brews. But when you look at it in the aggregate, they often have a hard time succeeding. Mm -hmm. But Ken Yukihiro, if you go back and look at the decks that he's top eight of the Pro Tour with, at least at the time that he played them, they were kind of out of left field. Yeah, and imagine the, the confidence you need to bring something like Selesnya Agro, basically your own build, mm -hmm. to this tournament. Or he's just crazy. We don't, could be one or the other. Or both. Yeah, could be both. Crazy confident. Indeed. <laughs> yeah, there you go. We found it. All right. Well, Arnaud here is uh, just swept the board himself using Deafening Clarion to leave the Golgari mid-range player, Namba, with nothing. Yeah, nothing they, I didn't have time before, but I wanted to... Uh, latch on to something that uh, De Prao mentioned in the interview. This Jeskai control deck was not only built to beat Golgari midrange, but it was also strategically placed in the middle seat because they were expecting the most Golgari decks to be in the middle seat. Interesting. I, I was wondering about that. I feel like, how can you game that? Yeah, there's a lot of randomness involved, but at least here at the World Magic Cup, you have this information that a lot of the captains mm -hmm. will be the most experienced players. So they will have to, uh, they will want to help out both other teammates. Not in Jap not in the case of Japan or France, mm -hmm. but in uh, we saw actually saw this in a lot of other cases. And then uh, you could argue that the Golgari mid range decks, especially the mirror matches, you want one of your strongest players. By the way, this this build from Hulk Miller on the right hand side of your screen is super sweet. We got to see this yesterday in the feature match area. His finisher is absurd. He kicks Fight with Fire and then copies it with yep. expansion. So this is the most spell-heavy um, Jeska control deck in the field. Mm -hmm. This is the, the version that even main decks r revitalize and basically doesn't want to expose uh, any creatures to, to removal spells, especially in game one. And I'll tell you what, he has been able to do that, even defeated Shahar Shenhar yesterday assembling that combo at one point doing it in, in an act of desperation F figuring that Shahar who had five or six cards in hand could do something about it he just didn't he had a disdainful stroke which is so awkward versus both of those cards the French are even main decking one Mirari conjecture mm. that is uh, the their, full grind huh? their tech card in this kind of deck well the technology that we see right now from Hulk Miller is really nice. Ral is at Viceroy feeling the hand. Cards like Revitalize, keeping his life total high at a relatively low cost, and he's just drawing infinite cards now thanks to uh, Jumpstart as well. So things getting well and truly out of hand. The downside, of course, to his big combo finish is the amount of mana that he needs to do it. It's nine mana plus the additional two, a total of 11. <laughs> it's hard to get to that point, but it is a convincing finish. He really needs to generate a lot of uh, card advantage, but with uh, a copy of Ral, three copies of Teferi, and of course the full playset of Chemistry's Inside. You you will get there at some point. He's one away right now. Yeah. And actually, what I um, what I like about that is you are somehow using your mana still, uh, even in the in the super late game. This is actually going to be pretty exciting because if he has an untapped land for next turn, we will get to see that combo happen. He's effectively guaranteed victory at this point. Given what he's got on the board, there's a Carnage Tyrant, and he just says, sure, let's see if he's got that land. 
He has a lot of shots at it, by the way. He can use, uh, there we go. There's a land off the top, and here we go. Watch this. Cast nine mana for a kicked fight with fire. Do 10 damage to you and copy it with expansion. You take a cool 20, and that's game number one going to France on the middle table. And uh, fight with fire is still a three casting cost card on the stack. That is an important uh, thing to remember here, which is actually kind of unfair because you're getting the effect of a nine mana card, but you're copying it for two mana. Yeah, when, when he first fired that off against Team Israel, they did double check with the judges to make sure it worked just out of, you know, diligence. Uh, Shahar knew, yes, that does work, but, you know, it never hurts to just double check. All right, well, that leaves one more table for us to check in on here as far as game ones go, and this one looks like a mess. Though the battlefield itself actually isn't such a mess. It's just four tokens and an Adanto Vanguard. It seems to be the only relevant permanents at the moment. Yeah, and it's mostly the graveyard of the Is It Drake's deck that is occupying <coughs> a lot of the, yeah. the space here. Yeah, both, Ma both Masahide drakes. with a mess of a graveyard yeah. there. Masahide has lost both of his drakes to Conclave Tribunals. He's down 5-0 to zero in creature cards. And um, the French player is now going to gain life, which makes it even more difficult to just win with, uh, with one of your drakes out of nowhere. But Johnny hits the battlefield now as well, so adding insult to injury as things looking good for Team France to take two of the three game ones in their favor here in our third quarterfinal. If you're just joining us, we're just over the halfway mark as far as the quarterfinals go. There's a shock, by the way, for Masahide. But uh, we've got one more coming after this, Italy versus Australia, and then we'll be on to the semis. So far, we've had Israel and Hong Kong advance to their semifinal match on the other side of the bracket. Additionally, it's nice to have you along. Thanks so much for joining us. This is the last iteration of the World Magic Cup, at least for the time being. And uh, these teams are all clamoring to be the last winner of it. What an honor that would be. Or well, the repeat winner in yes. the case of uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. Or Italy. Yet to be seen. So once again, Masahide is digging through his library, as this uh, deck does with Chart of Course and that kind of thing. He's attempted to separate out the cards, but we've got a nice indicator there. It looks like it's 13 instants and sorceries, so that is a lethal Drake on the battlefield right now. Yeah, but Though they are also it won't stay that way necessarily. I think he's also facing, facing lethal from this Lesnar tokens deck. So yes. apart from the fact that he wouldn't have... Yeah, he's dead. Uh, he wouldn't have a lethal, a lethal attack next turn. He's also just dead. Right, so double trouble there for Japan, and that is Timothée Jamon picking up game number one. So two game ones go to France, and uh, interestingly, their best player did not win his first game. So you got to like his chances there post-board. So we, we've, um, we've seen the green-white decks actually perform quite well uh, here in the first game. And the story of the weekend for me, uh, following the Celestia Tokens deck, has been that it hasn't quite delivered what players were, were hoping for, or it has also run into matchups that weren't as favorable as you would want. For example, the Boris Angels deck of uh, Hong Kong. But here, uh, so far, you can't really complain about green-white. Good start here for... Jean-Emmanuel Duprat, he's got the most explosive card in the deck, it has to be said, is Llanowar Elves. If he gets that on turn one, it can lead to some really explosive stuff happening. He gets uh, to start playing cards like Jade Light Ranger here on the second turn of the game. Let's see what he's got as his follow-up. This is important. Okay, it looks like he's going to take a little bit of the slower route here and play out <coughs> a Wild Growth Walker and a Tap Land and then pass a turn. And if, if you have a Wild Growth Walker, you want to drop it, of course, before you cast your Explore Creatures, even if it means um, making your mana curve a little bit weaker. And so now we can see Jade Light Ranger and Yukihiro in a real mess. And there it is, Jade Light Ranger for Jean-Emmanuel Duprat. And boom, the power of that Llanowar Elves already flexing its muscles here, although he could have made this curve regardless. Mm -hmm. But still, here comes a Wild Growth Walker, and he's attacking with it. Yeah, and this is what I love because Depra um, understands 
that he's not losing this game uh, in a racing situation. He loses this game if uh, Yukuhiro is allowed to build up a huge board, uh, mm. get, get down a planeswalker and uh, is never forced to block because then suddenly everything becomes stronger. And uh, I really like this, this attack by the Proud. Just trading three for three when you have the life gain card. This also weakens Alanto Vanguard quite significantly. Yes. Uh, oftentimes, it's, it feels we, we are trained to never give our opponents card advantage. So blocking and then paying four life for our card feels terrible. But when you do it the second time, you notice four life each, each time is quite the cost. Right. Deprat now taking a look at the board and seeing how he wants to progress. He has Vraska's Contempt in his hand perhaps doing some combat math. He says, you know what, at the end of the day, I'm still just going to make a clean attack here with my Wild Growth Walker. That does indicate that he's not going to be casting any Explore cards, though, this turn. So he passes the turn back to Yukihiro. Chapter 2 of History of Benalia triggers. So he's got two knights and an Adanto Vanguard versus Jade Light Ranger, Wild Growth Walker, and that Llanowar Elves. Ooh, but here's a Johnny for Yukihiro. This might be the quarterfinal with the most Ajani's uh, present. Yes. Both, <laughs> both green-white players decided to, um, to bring it to the, to the tournament. And once again, the attacks continue. This time, Yukihiro jamming with both of his available attackers. Yeah, one right. of the knights, of course, just uh, came into play. Right. We will be seeing this, uh, this Vraska's Contempt at some point this turn, probably on the Ajani there. And look at this. Topra says, you know what? I'm just going to take it. I'm going to get back two of it here right now anyway. So there goes the Johnny. Adversary of Tyrants is going to get exiled and two more life going back to Topra. And even though he's taken some hits, his life total has remained very high thanks to that Wild Growth Walker. Mm -hmm. And any future Explorer cards, in fact, the one off the top of the library that he just drew, are going to help that out as well. And History of Benalia, uh, not just a great card on its own, but also was protecting a Johnny there because of Vigilance. So even casting Rust's Contempt on one of the knights wouldn't have allowed Depra to get rid of get rid of Rajani uh, through damage. Yeah, impressive stuff. There's Wild Growth Walker picking up another counter and gaining three more life here for Depra. Now, he does have his hands full, though, next turn. And by the way, you can see the fine finality he's decided to keep on top of his library there. He does have the mana to cast it next turn. And actually, if you look at uh, these players' hands, Depra has... Too many lands, but he already has a fine finality. He will draw another one. Uh, this has two advantages. First of all, he has with the second one after you've cleared, after you've cleared the board once, you can just get back creatures. But also, your opponent doesn't know about the second one, might not play around it with the with the ma around the mass removal effect. And then on the other hand, you look at your hero's hand, and he's just Ooh. been drawing gas. Those nullhide feroxes, I didn't love them at first when I saw them, but. When you think about the, the meta game, the, which is a little bit inbred in, in Unified, finality is kind of the, the trump card that you're always fearing. Having a five or six uh, toughness creature in your deck is actually huge to not overextend into it. <laughs> There's Savage Stomp now from Yukihiro. I have not seen that one in a while. It's going to put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature he controls and then fight creature he doesn't. Costs less if you're targeting dinos, but that's not really the name of the game here. Mm -hmm. And that knight was not just a 3-3, three -three, but uh, this turn, Haster of Benalia was sacrificed, so it has plus two, plus one. Yeah, that's right. And that is a big deal, right? The Wild Growth Walker was kind of the the card that was going to be left standing post-finality mm -hmm. here for Depra. But as you mentioned, he does have the ability to get it back. But, you know, those counters are gone. It had three plus one plus one counters on the thing. I think I would vote Ken Yukihiro most likely to play Savage Stomp at the World Magic Cup before the tournament started. I if you knew he that delivered. If you knew that somebody was playing Savage Stomp? Yeah. Because otherwise you wouldn't even think of the card. I wouldn't even consider it. Okay, there's that fine finality off the top of the library, but in this case, it looks like we're going to go on the grind plan mm -hmm. here for Depra. He's just going to use find to dig back the two creatures he just lost. 
play one and then play the other. And next thing you know, boom, Wild Growth Walker's back on the battlefield with the counter on it, and he gets the life back as well. He draws at 25. But he needs to draw gas. And yes. more free lands is not what he's looking for. Even Wild Growth Walker, I don't love it in this spot because ultimately these green white decks can play a really scary late game. Yeah, I, I like the decision not to not to keep it here. You need your Carnage Tyrants now. Or maybe maybe a Vivian Reed. That would also be a, a good draw. Yuki Hero continues to apply pressure. He's going to attack with both creatures. Oh, the, on the on the first look, this does not look like a good attack. Right. So I'm wondering what Depra what uh, Yuki Hero is up his sleeve here, because Depra he actually has paused here. Like, well, I'm into this. I don't think he had anything. He's got. Thorn Lieutenant and one of the Nullhide Feroxes. So this is just Yukihiro just being very aggressive and exchanging four life of his own for four life of Dupra. Yeah, and if, if the Dental Vanguard doesn't attack, then Yukihiro was uh, probably concerned about double block options. Mm. But it did cost him dearly. He's down to 10. Yeah. And in the damage race, it's not close. It's in Dupra's favor here. No, it was it was at fourteen twenty eight. So your opponent had twice the life total, and and still you decide to go for minus four on both of these uh, mm -hmm. totals. Jade Light Ranger is going to attack. Is that signaling a uh, an incoming finality? Finality, absolutely. Uh, and your career should understand that. Once again, uh, br brilliant by Depra to understand that the life total of the aggro deck, even though he's playing uh, the control role, mm -hmm. is very relevant. It's a very relevant resource. And here we go. Finality number two of the game is going to leave behind the Wild Growth Walker now with four plus one plus one counter staring down a Nullhide Ferox on the other side of the battlefield. But Depra very much in the driver's seat at this point. Life total advantage, a 5-7 on the battlefield. He will need to get... You go ahead. Yukuhiro is out of gas a little bit after this turn, but also Depra needs to, needs to draw something. That Memorial to Folly is not bad uh, because you can get your Jade Light Ranger back, get more counters, maybe find something with it, but it would be much better to just naturally draw into one of your big uh, hitters. A little awkward here. Yukuhiro has to pay the two-man attacks that Nullhide Ferox puts on you just to get History of Benali down, but at this stage of the game, he's like, sure. Okay, and there's that Jade Light Ranger, and the grind is very real here for Team France. These things just keep coming back over and over again, and this allows him to attack for lethal and force Ken Yukihiro to now chump block with one of these knights. And more importantly, there was no good block that included the Nullhide Ferox. Mm -hmm. Now, there is another Nullhide Ferox in hand, I believe, for Yukihiro, and he also just drew a Johnny. Might be too little too late, though, for the captain from Japan. 4-3 Jade Light Rangers is a little bit problematic as well. Um, the Knight tokens are basically just chump blocking Wild Growth Walker. Yukihira has to really think about his outs here. Um, what kind of lines, what kind of plays give him the best shot at... Um, surviving against the White Growth Walker. Maybe, maybe a double block is uh, what he's planning to do, but I think he knows about the Rascal's Contempt that Depra left on his, left on his library, so uh, I think double blocking is not going to work out here. No, and a double block with a Knight and a Ferox is still not good enough to get through that two-mana Wild Growth Walker. It's insane to say that, but it's true. That thing has gotten well and truly out of hand with six plus one plus one counters on it. Thanks to some explorers and a fine and, and a finality. So if if Yukuhiro boards in baffling ends, 
How about Doom Whisperer? Oh, never mind. How about the Doom Daddy? So this thing has really spiraled out of control, and France absolutely will be taking this game down. Jean-Emmanuel Dupra picks up game number two and evens things up. Things looking good for France from this perspective now. That's game one's, uh, or one game across the board for the other side, and only one game one for Japan thus far. Okay, well, let's take a look at our middle table. This is Golgari mid-range versus Jeskai control. We saw a pretty nice finish there in game number one from Huckamiller. He uh, went for the big do 20 to you. Sure. And that finished off game number one. Mm. What I really like about this, this list that they've built is that it's good against Golgari, but Fight with Fire is also just a great card against the Izzet Drake stack. Uh, Enigma Drake, Crackling Drake, and Niv Mizzet you're all very happy to just cast an unkicked uh, fight with fire. Yeah, against. that is so sweet. Here's Jade Light Ranger on turn three, the first play of the game from either player from uh, Nanba, and it looks like he's got a full grip now after hitting two lands. And Hulk Miller says, well, you got a two one, I guess. Has to manage the resources in hand to figure out how best to win this game. There's that fight with fire you can see at the front. Yeah, fight with fire would be would be more convinced convincing if the if the Jade Light Ranger had grown to a to a four three, of course. Mm -hmm. Now the resources that Nanba got are in his hand. You can't burn those away. Hulk Miller has in hand a deafening clarion, so perhaps looking for a good moment to fire that off, but also keeping that information hidden here by playing the tapped steam vents rather than a planes. Mm -hmm. Signaling Just that small. No, but uh, in the end, it, it is leaving this option of uh, him being color screwed that the, that the Japanese have to consider. Mm -hmm. If he plays the planes, you, you know what's up. So, yeah. uh, absolutely correct play. Okay, there's another Jade Light Ranger, and it's going to find find. And what else? Finality. <laughs> Nope, Midnight Reaper, <laughs> as it turns out. But now this board has certainly gotten juicy enough to fire off one of the two Deafening Clarion in hand, especially before that Midnight Reaper hits the battlefield. Especially, uh, uh, of course, a two for one is better. Uh, a three for one is better than a two for one. But if Midnight Reaper comes down, it's not a three for one anymore. Right. So Midnight Reaper actually has been impressive uh, whenever I saw it. It's it really has. It's kind of tying this uh, Golgari midrange together in a lot of different matchups, especially the mirror match and the against the control decks, where even though it seems um, impossible, you can flood out with, with Golgari midrange. It's still, uh, it's, it's difficult to do, but it's possible. All right, so Huckamiller's gonna spring his trap. There is Deafening Clarion to wipe the board and keep his life total at a nice 18. But the shields are down basically here and Namba should have his way with the board, whatever he wants to do. The Jeskai control decks, or all control decks actually, really like to spend their turn four on Chemister's inside. Mm. So that's a small victory for, uh, for Nanba as well, that Hawk Miller decided this is not something that he can afford to do. Uh, no, he, d he doesn't have it, but for, from, from Nanba's perspective, he kind of used uh, the turn that um, you usually can take off. Wow, so Nanba's going for the, the the value grind as well, of course, this Golgari mid-range deck is built for this. He uses Fine to buy back two Jade Light Rangers, the ones that got swept away, and replays one this turn as well. He even found a Duress, as well as Thrashing Brontodon, though he decided to put that one in the graveyard. And this is the, this is the scary turn, where usually you are mentally prepared to, to face a Teferi, mm -hmm. and suddenly you might have a, a shot because you have a creature in play that is uh, potentially threatening it you have Russ's Contempt and even the backup to rest so that you're not just getting negated. Also, this is just a turn where Carnage Tyrant can come down. If you're sitting in Hawk Miller's seat, you're just thinking, well, is this going to get any better? The good news for him is that that's not what's going to happen here as Duress goes on the stack. But Hawk Miller says immediately, I am going to counter that using an Ionize. But now, another Duress is going to let Namba figure out what's going on. And... 
Well, it's a bunch of spells. It's two expansion explosions, another deafening clarion, and then that fight with fire that we mentioned to go with the island. Not a lot going on here. Well, it is, it is not a bad hand for control. Like we are, we're talking about four high impact cards and a sufficient a number of lands. The, the thing is, this hand doesn't really have a game plan. It is waiting right. on, on something, right? It's um, the expansion explosion. You might want to cast one of them for card draw, but you don't have infinite time in this matchup. So right now, Hawkmiller is kind of restricted in, uh, in what he can do. But he's going to be facing down two Jade Light Rangers. These have both already hit the battlefield, and bingo. Yeah, that is huge. Carnage Tyrant on top and the land drop to go with it. Yeah, so this one is really looks like it's starting to uh, look pretty bad here for Hawk Miller. He just doesn't have anything going on. And uh, don't forget how smart it is to take the Deafening Clarion away because one of the main ways to deal with Carnage Tyrant is actually to copy Deafening Clarion with Expansion Explosion. Oh, sure. W one reason why I like this, uh, this spell-heavy build of Jeskai so much is you're really using the expansion side of the split card in, in various... Great race. Simon, an uh, 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 interesting revelation here just happened. So there was revitalized to just draw a card and gain four life, but the card he found, Star of Extinction. Oh, that's not good for dinosaurs. Right. Five, six, oh my god. I have a theory uh, what, about what Star of Extinction it, it, when it, and how it relates to dinosaurs. So The theory of evolution? No, it's the opposite. No, it's not that one. Like, that might be Carnage Tyrant right there on the card right there. N Namba just spent his both both of his duresses. He saw that the coast is clear. Oh, God. He actually prevented Hawk Miller from being able to wrath his board with the uh, Deafening Clarion copied by expansion play. And Hawk Miller is just going to destroy this board. Also interesting that Hawk Miller did fire off the fight with fire. That really just has to have Namba convinced that there is not a Star of Extinction in his future. But there is... Take one of the dual lands away, and away goes the board for Nanba. So perhaps a bit of a reprieve here for Arnaud Hockemiller here from France. That was a big top deck for him. Absolutely. Now it depends on what Nanba can follow up with. Well, if you if you just play Jade Light Rangers every turn. <laughs> well, he's going to keep doing it, Simon. There's another one. That's probably... One of the best. It's not quite Arclight Phoenix, but it is the card that you want uh, against against this uh, Jessica control deck. I believe he drew Cleansing Nova now for yes, the turn as I well. Con I concur. So now he has to decide if he wants to give up some life total here to try to get another Jade Light Ranger at the minimum. And no, he is going to clear the way of this Midnight Reaper. This is a play pattern that we've seen a lot. Now, it usually is an explosion getting the job done, but... Killing the Midnight Reaper first seems to be the priority for these players. Mm -hmm. Making any future mass removal that much better. Right, and that was a big play again. So the Haymakers are really starting to come out because Explosion is going to reload Hockamiller's hand by three cards and stem the bleeding significantly, leaving just the Jade Light Ranger and forcing Namba to add more to the board. Yep. The, the French team just said, everybody is playing Golgari, and there is a way to beat it. And it's uh, with all these spells, all these uh, mass removal effects, and you can explore all you want. Uh, Star of Extinction is still going to take everything down. Well, he may need another one. There's a Wild Growth Walker and a Jade Light Ranger. Maybe he has another one. Bingo! Also, also that Cleansing also Nova. Also Cleansing Nova, but Star of about. Extinction Teferi? That's not good news. I don't know. It depends on where you're sitting. That's true. It's not good news for any dinosaurs, or in this case, explore creatures. But that hand is just completely absurd now for Hockemiller. I mean, he, he went from being having a hand that you described as having no plan, mm -hmm. and now he's casting multiple sweepers. Here's another one, the I, Cleansing Nova. I, I do feel a little bit bad about uh, Fornanba because the, the timing of the duresses was great. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he cleared the way. He did everything that you're supposed to do. Then, of course, you fill the board and you play your Carnage Times. That's what you do. And uh, for Hercule to, to just have a mass removal after mass removal, uh, even getting off a good explosion, that's just unfortunate. Here's another duress now from Nanba, and he's going to see. 
a tough hand to deal with. Uh, you know, Teferi jumps out as the most powerful option as the other cards. Two of them are, are effectively sweeper effects, but Expansion Explosion represents drawing a bunch of those cards right now, so he's going to take that away. Expansion Explosion is already plus four cards or plus five if Hawkmiller draws a land, so uh, you can't let your opponent have that. And you are holding, uh, or Nunba is holding Brustless Contempt, has been holding Brustless Contempt for almost the beginning of the game. Uh -huh. So. And oh. look at this play here from Hawk Miller. He just says, you know what? I'm good. Go. I'm not going to expose Teferi to a removal spell like that. And it's multiple removal or mass removal spells now in, in the hand of Hawk Miller. He is now sweeper flooded with double settle the wreckage as well as the Star of Extinction. And how in the world is Namba supposed to fight through all of these sweeper effects? Mm. He's down to nothing but Thrashy B. Thrashy, uh, Thrashing Brontodon's the only creature on the battlefield now. And how smart was this uh, Teferi play? Just saying, I don't have to play this because the likelihood of you having Restless Contempt is so high. I can draw into counter magic. Or if you play something that I really, truly can't deal with, I can still minus three to not get uh, immediately, get my Teferi handled without it having board impact. Really impressed by Arnaud's play here. I think most players would have just been like, boom, Teferi, get a card. Okay, fine, it's still a two for one, but nope. And this is, this is a difference. Um, it's actually possible that both of these plays are correct, uh, depending on your, on your Jeskai control list. So because Hockenmüller doesn't have many ways to win the game and doesn't have a lot of these uh, permanents to take over the game, he's a lot more careful with his Teferi. If you're playing a bunch of Nif Mizzets and four Teferi, then it's easier to just throw it into the, into the fold. Here is a uh, Midnight Reaper now from Nanba, which does actually resolve, though could just get exiled yeah, uh, by Settle the Wreckage. I do think that you have to play the Midnight Reaper before combat because of this uh, weird interaction with Seal Away. Yeah, which you actually did happen. We, you can actually um, make your Thrashing Brontodon go to the graveyard against Seal Away, so that would have made it a tiny bit more complicated for, for Hawk Miller. Yeah, and that, that I think that Hawk Miller would have been forced to use one of his two Settle the Wreckages instead. Or take three damage, or like, yeah. it definitely would have been better, I think. Midnight Reaper's on the board, but remember, Nanba knows about the Settle the Wreckage and doesn't want to just throw it in there, I suppose, unless he just feels like he has to just <laughs> chip through every single one of that absurdly stacked hand now four, for Hawk Miller. Four mass removal spells, one spell that deals 10 damage, one spell that copies the spell that deals 10 damage, and a Teferi as backup. Yeah. The interesting part here, too, is that uh, Hawk Miller's combo finish is not currently... is not currently online because Nanba's at 23. Okay, well, it looks like we're going to let this one come to its natural conclusion here, which seems to be Arno and Hakamiller winning, and we're going to go over to one of our back tables where there's some action happening here. It looks like Masahide with three drakes on the battlefield. Yeah. Okay. This is where the action is, is happening. Not for long if, uh, <laughs> if Masahide has anything to say about it. So this is so this is the comeback that uh, Japan needs on on both of these tables because table table B as we've seen, uh, Hockmiller has this all but locked up. Right, and if that's the case, then that's the first match going to France. We'll keep an eye on the little dots there on the bottom part of your screen to see when Hockmiller actually uh, seals the deal. But this game much more relevant, and it looks like a lot more going on here. So here's. Timothée Jamon, and he is getting in the red zone yeah. with Imara with two counters on her and the Venerated Loxodon. And here's one of the key cards. A Venerated Loxodon in the graveyard means that this gets a trade off for a Drake of his choice. Unless there's a dive down. Oh, and there is a dive down and for Masahide, and that's lethal, right? Massive, yeah. That's 15 points of uh, damage in the air right now. Uh, 
the trigger of Crawl Harpooner will get countered. Is there now a confusion about the timing of this? I think he didn't actually target one yet. Like, I think he put it on the battlefield and didn't target, and Masahide mm -hmm. assumed he would target the untapped Drake. Okay. And T Jamal was just saying, well, I haven't actually chosen which one. And then they said, all right, well, Masahide wants to use his dive down on the one that gets targeted, and that seems to be what happened here. And that could uh, end the game right here. Absolutely. It, it actually probably would have ended the game even if uh, Masahide <laughs> lost one of his Drakes. Right. Because... Uh, with one more instant or sorcery in his graveyard, all two of them are already lethal. Oh, there's, it has reach as it well. It does have reach, but I think you might have been right with any instant here. Oh, he doesn't have one. But he has, a, he has an Escanta. He has to use it. His, uh, his Drake shouldn't die, though. Okay, it, it this uh, is a little bit shaky. Yeah, so the, the end of this, he could have used his... Uh, I think his he missed, newly uh, he flipped e card. He either miscalculated or he missed the reach on the Crawl Harpooner. Okay, but can he actually get punished here? Well, he's one point off uh, losing. Okay, so he absolutely can get punished here? He has a disdainful stroke, but there must be some some way, uh, some card that Jamo can, can draw that uh, wins him the game here. Whoa. Whoa, this could get very, very shaky here for Japan down the stretch. Masahide with a bit of a misstep here. But right now, he's taking 9 and not 10. And that makes the difference. Oh, my goodness. Is he going to end up at 1? He certainly has lethal in the air, even with some life gain here from Jamon. And, yeah, he just passes the turn back. It looks like Japan may have gotten away with one here. Oh, and I, I did check most of the, um, most of the ways to lose for Masahide. Uh, are expensive. Are expensive. Yeah. A four plus cars, casting cost card, so Ajani, uh, you would he would have been able to counter Tristani. Um, Tristani Discord, and he would have been able to counter, and yep. Flourish, he would have been able to counter, even yep. though Jumbo didn't have the mana. So there was, there was a sweat, but. Uh, Sigh of relief for Japan, Simon. In the end, uh, he. If he really. If he knew that there was not a single card that killed him there, it was actually played uh, perfectly. <laughs> okay. Just not for our uh, hard rates. Yes, exactly. But that was Japan picking up that game down on table C. And that means we're going to move back up here to our two superstars. This is Ken Yukihiro versus Jean-Emmanuel Dupra. Both of these gentlemen are going to be in the Magic Pro League, the, the top 32 players that uh, that were invited to that so you'll be seeing a lot of these two gentlemen and they'll be seeing a lot of each other as well by the way of note here Hulk Miller still hasn't sealed the deal on the middle table it's like he's taking his time not particularly relevant we are in untimed rounds here in our top eight so he can no th there's, there's no punishment for it there's of course this tiny fraction of a chance that Namba still has um but I think the, the probability of, of Namba winning this game is so minuscule that it's, it's much, more, much better for us and the viewers that we get to actually see the games mm -hmm. uh, th that are relevant. What is this? What in the world? That did, was I just did I just miss? Did I just see Ken Yukihiro take four instead of one? Yeah. Did he miscalculate? Did he think that his Adanto Vanguard has more power? 3 1 or on something? Defense? Wow, okay. I think that was just a misstep from Yukihiro, who perhaps noticed it and thought, oh, well, what am I doing? And I better at least save my creature. These last three minutes haven't looked great from no, Japan. No, they haven't. I, I wonder if uh, there's a little bit of nerves. Remember, they were far behind. Before Masahide scraped out that win on the bottom, it was three wins plus Hakamiller probably winning his match against one win on the other side. It, it looked like the wheels were coming off, though. At this point, we're right back in the fight here because Masahide was able to finish that one out, and Yukihiro perhaps a little shaky at this point, but, uh, you know, putting up, putting up a fight here for sure. He's got history of Benalia to follow up. I think that uh, Yuko here is losing a little bit of his, of his edge, of his advantage in the top eight. 
uh, games when the deck lists are completely known. Sure, especially from the type of decks that he brings, like this one. It, this deck in particular, yeah. because if you play against it in game one, you might just think this was a token deck with a somewhat weird draw, or maybe Yoko Hero is playing uh, four cards uh, that that other other players are not playing. But in fact, he's playing a completely different archetype. Yeah, the much expected dot by Huck Miller's name has appeared, by the way. So that is a match number one going to Team France, and now. They're in that beautiful position where a single game win from here on out will put them into the semifinals, and Japan has a mighty hill to climb. This is going to be difficult for them. Mm -hmm. They've got to win a lot of games to finish this off. Now, it could just be Masahide wins and Yukihiro wins this, and then they could close it out. That, that could happen, but they need to. So if you ask me, I like, I like the matchup of Is It Drake's against oh, I'm the asking. Tokens. Uh, because in the end, you are you are just playing the scarier deck, mm. uh, and you are not giving Slesnia tokens the time it really wants uh, with your with your clock. But the matchup that Yoko Hero is playing, it does not look great. So we have to we have to see here. Yoko Hero is has decided to attack for eight, and that attack did not go at Vivian Reed. So. If he attacks Vivian Reed, Debra can can chump block to keep her alive on one loyalty, or can just say, I've just gained eight life. Mm -hmm. And that's also fine. And so got my card back. Exactly. And Yuko Hero, I think smartly goes for the life total here because th that extra activation of Vivian Reed was, was happening anyway. Just backfired though pretty badly here, Simon. That is the one-two punch that he did not want to see. Wild Growth Walker plus Jade Light Ranger for six life gain. And all of a sudden, a rather attainable nine becomes a distant 15. Need some counters there, too. And, and what, I, what I really fail to see is how Yuko Hero's build really um, wins from these kind of board positions. Right, this is the downside of the types of build that he has uh, put together. With the, with the Celestia Tokens deck, you can always just draw into uh, your March of the Multitudes, you can sideboard in the Immortal Sun, and play a much longer game against uh, against Golgari midrange. Here, I see a bunch of 3-1s and 2-1s against a board that is just huge. I like, the, I like the minus three on the baffling end. Mm -hmm. Get yourself a little 3-3 three, three trampler Just there. A, as, many, as many blockers as possible. Yeah, even played out a Llanowar Elves from his hand to just flood the board with blockers. That turn was absolute explosion there for Depra. Look at the board now. Before that turn, he didn't have the 3-5, he didn't have the 4-3, he didn't have the 3-3, three, three, and he didn't have the 1-1. One, one. <laughs> He went a pretty good turn. From two non-lands to six. Yeah. And now Ken Yukihiro is stuck doing some pretty awkward combat math here. Again, with Depra now at a comfortable 15 life, Yukihiro just doesn't have the ability to try to slam the door on this game in an attack step or two. It's going to take a much more prolonged effort, and his deck just doesn't seem super well built for that. No. He can attack with everything here. This is the turn where the knights are stronger, and the... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dauntless, uh, the Danto Vanguards are only dominated by Wild Growth Walker. So that's that's something. Maybe a Conclave Tribunal to take out the Walker. We already know that Yukuhiro doesn't uh, is not here to fight against Vivian Reed, but mm -hmm. is going for the throat. This placement of the knight makes me think that the other knight token is uh, is being protected here. So the Attacking bodyguard, uh, you can actually see it, is protecting the, the knight on the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. Bodyguard, also the recipient of that benefit from the history of Benalia. Mm -hmm. That's a 4-3 bodyguard mm -hmm. uh, attacking. Sorry, 4-2. So big blocks here from Jean-Emmanuel Dupra. Looking to seal the deal for Team France and put them into the semifinals where they would join Israel and Hong Kong 
if they are successful in doing so. And on the other side of the table, this is Japan fighting for their tournament life. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ken Yukihiro is the one on the Japanese team that you would hope to be in this position, but he looks a bit outmatched here from this Golgari deck from Dupra. Yeah, and, and not just a little bit, if I'm if I'm being honest. This mm -hmm. this game didn't look particularly close. Depra got down to nine, and then th what he was able to rebuild, also looking at Yoko Hero's hand, uh, just two creatures that are not going to be relevant on this board. Maybe maybe an earlier uh, Conclave Tribunal uh, convoked, get rid of the Wild Growth Walker uh, this turn. At least your attacks are looking better. Oh, it did look like Vivian is took some damage here. Took all the damage here, it looks like. So Vivian Reed does go away. So perhaps a, a fruitful attack there from Yukihiro. He still has big problems on the other side of the battlefield. The Thorn Lieutenant may not help, but... You don't just, you don't just switch... Uh, to, to control mode after your after your aggression has hasn't worked out. Right. The the thing is the damage is done and Depra with with an attack on Vivian actually had the luxury of making exactly the blocks that favored him and letting everything else through. If I'm not mistaken, he actually has a backup Vivian read in hand. He has a Carnage Tyrant and the mana to cast it and even a removal spell. Yeah, things looking very good for Team France from this perspective. In fact enough that attacks are happening now with the Carnage Tyrant follow-up play. He feels safe enough to start slamming on the life total here of Ken Yukihiro, and he is ahead in that race. Yukihiro down to nine with Depra still at 15, and one of the best blockers in the format on his side, Carnage Tyrant. So the reigning World Magic Cup champions, I don't think are going to get the trophy this no, year. No, might not be back-to-back -back for them. There's Amarasol of the Accord. But that is really just a 2-2 at this juncture. And Yukihiro passes the turn back to Depra, who's looking to finish things off. His hand is stacked. He has two copies of Vivian Reed and Assassin's Trophy. And he is very much in the driver's seat to push France to the semifinals. The, the reason he's thinking here is he, he actually has an attack, but at the same time he knows he doesn't, he doesn't have to attack. Mm -hmm. There is just very little that the Yuko Hero can do. Now if you drop a Planeswalker, Yuko Hero might once again feel uh, the need to attack you, which means you get another two creatures uh, for free and uh, win that way. No way out here for Ken Yuki Hero, it seems. And look at this, Tapraz is going to attack anyway. Get in the red zone. He's got that Vivian Reed sitting there saying, you can attack me or you can attack my life total, but either way, I'm winning this race. And that's also, uh, once again, a much easier attack to make when you know exactly what your hero has in his 75. Mm -hmm. in, the, in this race portion, you wouldn't have known if there was a March of the Multitudes in his hand uh, or what kind of pump effects he could have, and you, you, you don't make these aggressive lines. But here it's such pressure. This is a lethal attack from Dupra forcing some type of action by Yukihiro at the minimum. Ken clearly would like to try to get rid of the Carnage Tyrant, but that would cost him his board. So perhaps just chump blocking is his best option here. So put him at two life. Wildly outclassed on board as it sits. You, you have to give uh, Yuko Hero credit here for really milking everything, trying to, trying to just find those lines that give him the best shot at winning, maybe even just surviving, maybe thinking about every single card that he boarded in that might still give him a chance against, uh, against the Carnage Tyrant. Okay, he's going to have to just lose his Adanto Vanguard here. It hits the graveyard, perhaps the last draw step for Japan, and that's going to do it. Team France advances to the semifinals here in quarterfinal number three. Congratulations to Team France. And you can see the sigh of relief there. They ran into one of the tougher teams in the field here in Japan, and they were able to get by them and put themselves in the semis. We mentioned it before, but the quarterfinal one, we played that this morning. It's done. That was Hong Kong defeating Slovakia. Quarterfinal two was Israel versus China, with Israel with that improbable win from Shahar Shenhar putting his team 
into the semis, and now we have France joining the fray as well. There's only one more seat left in our semis. That's going to be decided in quarterfinal number four, Italy versus Australia. If you're just joining us, well, we're approaching the halfway point here on Sunday at the World Magic Cup. Welcome back to the booth. Marshall Suckliff with Simon Gertzen. Thanks so much for coming along and uh, spending a little Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, or Sunday morning with us as we crown our last World Magic Cup champion here in Barcelona. We've got Again, one more quarterfinal to bring you coming up shortly, and then we will be on to the semifinals. Before you know it, it'll be the finals, and we'll be crowning a World Magic Cup champion. We're going to take a short commercial break. When we come back, we'll have more. Don't go anywhere.